All right, so uh, I'm Alexandra Blackman. I'm an assistant professor in the government department. Um, and I'm really excited to be introducing Fee today. Fee Sue is an assistant professor at Williams College. Um, and before that, she was a postdoc at NYU Abu Dhabi, where we overlapped for some time. And she became a good friend. So I'm really thrilled to have her. Um, Fee just uh, published a book with Stanford University Press called The Border Within. Um, which looks at Vietnamese migrants in Berlin. And then she's going to be talking about that book with us today. I'm really, really thrilled to have Fee here. And uh, I'm happy that, that you all will be able to interact with her. So um, give me a hand in welcoming Fee to the lecture today. Thanks so much for that introduction, Alex. And Thank you to Ali Tamar and Southeast Asia Program for bringing me here and to Emily, who I think is maybe somewhere in the next group or upstairs. Thank you. Thank you to Emily, who will see this recording later, perhaps for making arrangements. I want to start off by saying I have long COVID. I'm no longer contagious. It's been several months, but if you have a hard time hearing me because of the hoarseness, just raise your hand and I'll repeat. I also have Lingering brain fog, which has been really fun. So I'm just going to make sure to repeat back your questions to make sure that I understand them. I thank you again so much for for your patience. Can folks on the Zoom hear okay? We can hear you. Perfect. Thanks so much. So as Alex mentioned, I'm really excited to share with you today my book, which just came out last year. Of the border within Vietnamese migrants transforming ethnic nationalism in Vietnam. And before I jump into the actual talk, I'd like to just share with you a one minute video clip that I hope will give folks a good overview of the timeline of some of the migrations and the geopolitical events that I'm interested in. Okay. Eva, if it's okay, I'm going to play again just for a second to make sure that you can hear and then I'll play the full. Is that okay? Were you able to hear that? Yep. Okay, great, thank you. And folks in the audience, was that loud enough? Yeah. Should I, some, some at the back or, okay, maybe I'll turn it just a tad bit louder. At 21, Thai lost his homeland. After South Vietnam fell in 1975, Thai escaped and resettled in West Berlin. As Thai lost a homeland, Jin gained a fuller one. Born in North Vietnam, she went to work in the Eastern Bloc at 18. Just months after Thai and Jin arrived in Europe, the Berlin Wall fell. The 90s were a time of massive upheaval, but also of ethnic solidarity. Yet, by the time I arrived in Berlin, people warned me that there were two Vietnamese communities there, embodied by Jin and Thai, North and South, and they didn't get along. So how did we get here? I invite you to follow along with Thai, Jin, and others like them as they rebuild their lives after war and border crossings. Along the way, they teach us to rethink the nation and our role in it. Take a look. Hope oh, folks were able to hear that okay. So that's what my voice usually sounds like without long COVID. So as I mentioned in the trailer, I was really interested in learning about how people rebuild their lives after war and border crossings. And actually at the point that I started research, I was interested in something more specific, which was how do people relate to politics and particularly the politics of anti-communism. At the time, I was doing field work, ethnographic field work in Southern California, but it seemed to me like the U.S. was something of a special case if I was interested in how people might learn about or transplant politics with them across the life course because mass migration from Vietnam to the U.S. happened in the context of the Cold War. Thank you. 
Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. So where was I? The Cold War. So serendipitously at the time, I was practicing German, which I had been studying since through the Deutsche Welle. And I just stumbled on this piece by Sebastian Schubert called Berlin's Vietnamese Wall. And the subheading reads, the German capital is home to thousands of Vietnamese, but the communities in the East and those in the West remain divided even 15 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So here appeared to be this really cool, natural situation in which migrants who were leaving from a country that was divided and later reunified arrived to a country that was divided but then later reunified. But one thing that was interesting about it was that this also had a history of leftist movements. So it wasn't a place where the folks who were arriving from Vietnam were only refugees. So as I mentioned in the trailer, I touched down in Berlin in 2013, and I just started going to restaurants, to cultural organizations, religious sites, trying to figure out if I could make this a viable field site. But for folks who do ethnographic work, you know that it often surprises us, even if we're not, even if we're hoping that things will go quite smoothly. So I got to Berlin, and then pretty soon, quickly, the part about explicit politics dropped out. I'm happy to say more later in our conversation, but the short version is that people from across migration streams, so either contract worker, international student, refugee, marriage migrant, et cetera, seem to have really converged on shared understandings of democracy, attitudes toward the communist state, et cetera. And yet, what I was really interested in was that, or what I became more interested in was when I would introduce myself to folks and say, I am being a student who's interested in Vietnamese people's lives here. One of the things they kept saying to me when folks would meet me for the first time was, well, first off, you have to understand that there's not one but two Vietnamese communities here, and they don't get along. Folks often told me this regretfully. And so one person who did so is someone I call Lan, who came to West Berlin in the 1980s through family reunification for refugees. And we were hanging out one, one weekend at her apartment, we were up into the early morning talking and we we're watching these shots of Vietnam on TV and she was in a wistful mood. And she said, I look at Germans and I feel that they're so lucky. Why were they able to feel like that after the unification of many of I want to be very clear that Germans don't necessarily feel like the world <laughs> after the unification, right? And that there's a persistent feeling, especially among folks from the former East, that reunification was very uneven and only acknowledges certain histories and, and victors. And yet, I bring up this quote because it was so recurring across the Vietnamese folks I would talk to that it really made me wonder what is this, what is being implied in this call for reconciliation, for reunification? when the geopolitical events and the, the borders that created these divisions have already been reversed. Or put differently, why do home line divisions persist long after the geopolitical events that created them have changed? And this question again really grew out of just conversations with folks who were expressing some sort of idea that there was some category that needed to be made whole again, but that hadn't been. My answer to this question is that border crossings have preserved everyday Vietnamese people's sense of ethnic nationhood while working to undo their commitment to ethnic nationalism. So by border crossings, I mean both borders crossing over people through state formation, as we saw in Vietnam in 1954 and 75, and then in Germany in 1945 and 1989 and 90. I also mean people crossing over borders through international migration. By ethnic nationhood here, I'm really interested in folks' subjective sense of belonging, the ways that they express a myth of common descent, social solidarity, distinction vis-a-vis -vis other nations. And I'm using nationalism here in a very specific way, which is the principle 
that the cultural and the political units or the nation and the state should be conformed so that there should be one state to represent the nation of Vietnam. Before I get into the actual storytelling and my research sites, I want to say that just like the Deutsche Welle piece that I showed you a few slides ago, folks in Germany, whether they were Vietnamese origin, ethnic German, or other migrant groups, really clung to these ideas that refugees were people who came from South Vietnam and were leaving in reaction, in, in opposition to communism and were therefore loyal to the yellow flag with three red stripes. Folks also assumed that contract workers were people who came from Northern Vietnam, went to East Germany and the Eastern Bloc because they had been loyal to the red flag with the yellow star. But as you heard in the trailer, one of the first interlocutors I mentioned by actually was born in the North and was part of a mass group of folks who migrated south in 1954. Because the labor contract program actually took off in 1980 after the country had been unified, that means there were people from throughout the country who went about as contract workers. But what's important here is that folks still reproduce these mappings and these assumptions, even when they knew better, even when they knew folks who were southern contract workers or northern refugees, or even if they themselves did not fit these mappings. And so I just want to lay that out before we dig into the storytelling to mention that even though there's a discrepancy between on the ground, this was the geopolitical mapping that folks reproduced. So we have to say more in our conversation later, but I conducted participant observation at three Buddhist pagodas, one of which I'll talk about, and two cultural organizations. I also conducted interviews and I followed up with key interlocutors. So I'm going to say a bit about the two cultural organizations to start with. The first one I call Refugees for Germany, or RFG, and the second one, Friendship and Adventure. They have really different memberships, approaches to welcoming new folks, and also ways that they spent time together and expressed what the nation represented to them. So Refugees for Germany was largely refugees and or Southerners. Friendship and Adventure was largely Northerners and or contract workers, former contract workers. And the two interlocutors you heard about in the trailer, I met the first time I went to both of these sites, both in Berlin. Bai ignores me the first day that I go to Refugees for Germany. And instead, the uncle, who's one of the co-organizers of this space, invites me in and then quickly ushers me to a kitchen off to the side where all of the ants are. And he's like, yeah, just go play over here. And it's not until two weeks later, actually, that Bai first speaks to me and then he starts to ask about my upbringing in the US. So he's revealing that he's already heard a bit about me before being willing to say hi. Jin also didn't say much to me when we first met, but it wasn't because she was trying to suss out my political allegiances. So we were at a holiday party. It was a long, narrow room, kind of like this one. So there was a big table down the hallway. And she was just busy eating and chatting and having fun with the other aunts and uncles there. And then the three organizers, or leaders at the time of Friendship and Adventure, put the microphone just like this and said, we have a visitor here. He is a student who's visiting from the US. Could you help her with her research? And at this point, I'm sitting kind of in the middle of the room across the table from Jin's husband, Nia, who was also a former contract worker to the Eastern Bloc, who's from Northern Vietnam. And we start exchanging greetings in Vietnamese just very quickly, two, three words. And he hears my southern accent, by the way. And he says, oh, Saigon girl speaks so sweetly. And then they agree right then and there to help me. You can already gauge, or I hope you can already gauge from this introduction, that both organizations dealt very differently with strangers and what you had to prove about your allegiances to be able to join. So for RFG, it was pretty steep, and a lot of the events were really trying to meld South Vietnamese belonging with German, and I would add parenthetically West German allegiances. By contrast, Friendship and adventure was really open to anyone who identified as Vietnamese and just wanted to hang out. And 
their celebration, their events were largely celebrations of a reunified nation, albeit in the image of the former North. So they would sing songs like Spring over Ho Chi Minh City, not over Saigon, right? But they really meant it as a gesture of the war is over. We are all one country now. So I want to introduce you at this point to two key interlocutors who try to straddle both of these organizations, refugees for Germany and friendship and adventure. The first is someone I call Hutton, who at the time was an international student. She was born and raised in Hat Home in northern Vietnam, and she had come there to, to study. And for part-time work, she was assisting with a university professor's research on mental health. So she was trying to pass out surveys and, of course, trying to diversify the sample. So she wanted to get respondents from northern, central, and southern Vietnam. When I learned this, I said, hey, I go to these organizations. Come with me, and we can meet folks together. So she started coming with me in, I want to say, January or February of 2016 to just try to get respondents. And the first such event was at this Vietnamese, uh, this cultural night for the Vietnamese refugee community of Berlin. This flyer had been hanging around the walls of one of the pagodas that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And so we said that we would meet at this event, which had started at 5.30. I get there around 6. And Hatton is in this big auditorium, just kind of standing by herself against the wall, trying not to, not to get too much attention. And so we're in this auditorium because people are about to start performances, and there are kids as young as four years old who are singing these so-called yellow songs that, that are reminiscent of life in South Vietnam before 1975. And I'm singing along to these songs because I grew up with them, and it's just kind of automatic. I know the lyrics without trying to think too much about it. And at one point through one of these songs, Hatton starts to really shift uncomfortably, and I'm like, hey, Chi, your older sister, are you okay? And then she points to the sign above the stage, which is etched onto the flag of former South Vietnam, and it says Vietnam Freedom Spring. So at this point, because I've just been kind of mindlessly singing along, I think this as an exercise in national unification, but then this breaks me out of it as a reminder that this is actually a symbol of national division for Hatton. And because South Vietnam no longer exists on the world map, this flag can't be apolitical in the same way that folks can treat the red flag as apolitical. Not in the US, but in other spaces, right? So on the next slide, I'm going to talk about when Hatton first met an uncle I call Hua. He was an officer in the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. So he was in a re-education camp for a couple of years after the war ended. And one time Hatton came with me to refugees for Germany and met him. And came with me to Refugees for Germany and met him, and he heard her northern accent. And so he said, Oh, I'm going to host people at my house for a protest, and you're both welcome to come. And I was like, Uncle, what's the protest about? And he's like, It's against communism. But Hatton, I want you to know because I'm against the regime, not individual communists. <laughs> so that was kind of my reaction, too. And I was like, Hold it. <laughs> So, but you already see here the mapping that he makes of Hutton, Northern accent, communist, right? This is going to come up a bunch more times, and we'll come back to him really shortly. But I want to introduce the second key interlocutor, who I call Un, and she had actually come on a visa to Germany that she overstayed. She's from the Mekong Delta, and she was just really outgoing and friendly. So she would show up to events for RFG and FAA, mostly because she wanted to make friends. So one time I was done interviewing Kwa at his apartment, and he says, what are you doing the rest of the day? And I said, oh, I'm going to go visit Ani at her workplace. She works at this Chinese fast food restaurant in kind of this middle central, sorry, middle east slash eastern part of Berlin. 
And I don't invite him, but he says, oh, I'm going to come with you, but you're a bad judge of character because she's not someone who can be trusted. So I'm like, okay, we, <laughs> we take public transit together and we get to the place where she works. So these are actually photos that he hangs in his apartment commemorating officers who actually committed suicide on April 30th instead of surrendering to Northern forces. So he's really all about South Vietnam. Right? But we get to the restaurant, the fast food restaurant, and Anne is sitting there and the owner of the restaurant's husband comes in. I call him Love and he's friends with Hua. And so they start chatting and Anne says, oh, while you're here, you should fill out this survey to help this student because she also knows Hatton, right? And she's super gregarious and she's just like, we can all help one another take the survey, right? So they get this survey, they start flipping through it and they slam it down. And they're like, this survey was sent by a communist. So Anne and I look at each other and we're like, oh crap, let's try to de-escalate, right? So I'm like, Uncle Ha, I, I know her and I actually asked many of the same questions, a lot of demographic questions, what's your migration history, et cetera. And he was like, yeah, but you don't ask people to write it down. Two hours before this, I had voice recorded him and taken photos of his home with his permission, right? But again, I'm, I'm trying to de-escalate. So they changed the topic, they start pulling beers out of the cooler that's next to the fridge that's next to them. They're chugging. They're eating these roasted peanuts. And then maybe an hour later, they come back to the survey abruptly and they're like spitting out these chunks of roasted peanuts as they're speaking, saying, I'm going to tell RFG, I'm going to complain about this survey. And I was like, uncles, I know Hutton. She's just a student. And when academics conduct surveys, we want to prove to funding sources that real people took them, right? So we're, we're trying to get some of this information just to say that we didn't completely run off with this money. And, and also, I asked many of the same questions. And at this point, he gets really belligerent, and he snaps at me, Hua, that is, and says, I can ask him anything because I'm from the U.S. and I'm the daughter of a Southern officer who was imprisoned. Had I been from Vietnam and asking him these questions, he would have strangled me. I am actually from Vietnam. I, so here I read it as him saying, had I been from Northern Vietnam, right? And also at this point, I look at Anne and she just kind of scoffs and rolls her eyes like whatever. But I'm looking at Ha and he looks completely serious. So this is deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> But like a lot of research, it's perverse in that the, the discomfort is also very instructive, right? Because it, it shows how so much of the healing that Lan was asking for, why haven't we reunified, right? Happens in these everyday interactions, in these routine conversations where they are drawing boundaries around who belongs fully to the nation. I want to pause and say though that even when Hua imagines he fully belongs to the ethnic nation, he spends a lot of his time fundraising to send money back to disabled veterans in Vietnam. And when I asked him, I asked him in the interview before this, Uncle, why do you do this? He said, because they're my brothers and sisters. They're my ethnic kin. So it's not that they're completely rejected from the ethnic nation, but that there's a discrepancy here between a sense of cultural ethnic belonging versus allegiances and solidarity in other ways that can be. So, so far I've talked to you about these two cultural organizations, one primarily refugee, one primarily contract worker, and they're really operating in isolation from each other, and the folks don't really intermingle, save for Hatton and, and me. So I really wanted to find a place where people from across migration streams and regions of origin came together. And in 2015, 2016, the only place that I located was this Buddhist pagoda in Western Burma. It's called Lin Pagoda, and it was founded 
in West Berlin, the context of the Cold War started off as just a group of small folks meeting to talk about the readings and, and the scriptures and understandings, their understandings of Buddhism in an apartment complex. And they slowly built it up to this elaborate two story pagoda. And when the Berlin Wall fell, the folks who were lay disciples of this then budding pagoda and community came out to offer sanctuary. So they would just go out to the wintry streets of Berlin and kind of look around for Asian faces and be like, here are you Vietnamese? Come home with me. I'll give you food, you can buy your clothes, I'll help you file for asylum. And I found references to this actually in some of the writings that lay disciples posted throughout the early 90s as well. By all accounts, this solidarity very soon soured. And people would say that it had to do with things like the words that people would use to say hello friend versus hello comrade. And soon the folks who identified with South Vietnam would start showing up to this religious space with the yellow flag sewn onto their clothes or just hanging into their pockets. And today, or actually as of six years ago, I was last in Berlin in 2019. So as of four years ago, the physical division of the space still persisted. And it was really obvious to me from the first day that I visited the pagoda, where I walked into the ground floor kitchen, I was greeted by two Northern Way disciples who were just cleaning up, fed me a piping hot bowl of vegetarian noodles, and then sent me down to the basement where half a dozen Southern Way disciples we're helping the resident nuns make these vegetarian desserts for an upcoming festival. And they were singing Southern songs and they were joking like, our girls from Sa Saigon or from Call Prettier. And so the division of the space was very clear. Even though by 2015, 2016, the photo was predominantly attended by Northerners, not by Southerners. And there's a lot of discussion about how the money, the infusion of capital from former contract workers who stayed and became entrepreneurs after the fall of the Berlin Wall actually enabled the construction of this elaborate pagoda. And yet you still see claims making on the space in several ways. So one of those ways comes up in just two slides, but I first want to set the context for the penultimate Lunar New Year's event in 2016, where a lot of folks, lay disciples, I think I'm sitting all the way at the back in the photo on the right, are coming to the pagoda and sharing the names of deceased loved ones with the nuns. The nuns are reading off this, reading the names, and then afterwards, they're all going to go downstairs for a vegetarian feast that volunteers have been preparing. And so the tables have been set pretty tightly, and soon we're going to start setting up our hot pot. You can see in the image to the right, there's a stage at the front of this dining room. You see these yellow apricot blossoms branching out from this ornate vase. We tend to find these in southern Vietnam during, during this holiday season. And soon there's going to be a succession of karaoke singers, and in between there are these live performances. And one of the songs, I'm just going to play the background melody for you. So the song is called Cry River, and it goes, I often think of home in the afternoons, especially on the afternoons. Luckily, California being seldom, unlike Saigon, otherwise I'd have cried the river. And getting out for the photo. So the song recalls the loss of South Vietnam and its capital in Saigon. And it also reaches across the diaspora to mention the largest Vietnamese community outside of Vietnam in California. It's a very melancholic song, which I hope you were able to hear a little bit of. And it's particularly jarring because we're at this celebration where we're about to chow down in just five minutes. So the song has been playing on repeat. And there's a woman sitting two seats to my left, I propped her out. I call her home, and she is. She's the sister of Anne, so she's also from southern Vietnam. She came as an economic migrant to the unified Germany. 
And halfway through the chorus of one of the repeats of the song, she reaches over the table, over this person to my left, and says, do you notice that? All of the songs are from the South. And she's indicating to whom this pagoda belonged. Before and after this event, how I really insisted, I don't discriminate against our Vietnamese brothers and sisters. I like to make friends with everyone. She also really took opportunities to mock what she saw as Northerners' utter lack of proper behavior in a sacred religious site. So to come back again to Lynn's question, why have Germans been able to heal? The quick answer is, um, but why have they been able to heal when we haven't? And that, again, is through the policing of these social networks, as with friendship and adventure and refugees for Germany, and also through just demarcating what are proper practices in a shared religious space that is really supposed to leave these political, as, as they understand it, that is supposed to leave these political secular values at the door of Mother Nature. So I'm going to wrap up here just to say that the key takeaway here was that the nation really powerfully shaped how my interlocutors understood their opportunities at work, which is a chapter of the book that I didn't talk about so much today but also that it shaped their opportunities for friendships, for forming healthy families, or religious practices. And so social scientists know that the idea of nationhood that's based on shared ethnicity isn't important to everyone all the time, or much of the time even. But for my interlocutors, it was really important a lot of the time in this context of Berlin, where they had other folks who they considered part of the same ethnic nation, but who represented an entirely different vision of what Vietnam should be. And we can see this, or we see this in the ways that these labels of North and South, and I, I should actually capitalize here, North, South, capital N, capital S, refugee, contract worker, communist, and anti-communist endure, even though the geopolitical conditions that created these labels really aren't around anymore. And my answer again is that through their routine words and actions, people are keeping these boundaries alive. And so to just wrap up this part of our conversation, I want to emphasize again that this book's protagonist really rejected the principle of one nation, one state. And so for them, the irony is that the undoing of physical borders has not undone social ones. And it's almost as though the division of the homeland was completed thousands of miles away, decades after. The well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. So we'll welcome questions from uh, the audience here. And uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, could you give me a little background on the contract, the contract workers in uh, Berlin, what they were there, there for? And yeah, thanks so much for the question. So also just to check with my brain fog and to let folks on Zoom here. So the question is, say a bit more about contract workers in East Berlin and East Germany. Thank you. So contract work program is these series of bilateral trade, the bilateral labor agreements that the Socialist Republic of Vietnam signed with East Germany, other countries, the USSR, Bulgaria, and other other players in the Eastern Bloc. For East Germany, it started in 1980 formally, but it actually followed on decades previously of students who were coming to East Germany to get trained, of experts of, sorry, networks of experts who were circulating across these socialist fraternity contexts. So not just Vietnam, but Mozambique, Angola, Cuba, et cetera, often of Germans sending experts to these countries, and then these countries sending students and or workers. And so folks came on these short three to five year contracts that were often renewable. The first wave that came in 1980, at least what I understand of what's been documented, is that they were more elite. But by the time that you get to 1988, 1989, you start to get folks who don't come as from as elite backgrounds. And it was also more gender balanced than the refugee flows. So the refugee, the boat refugee folks tended to be more males, or if they were females, they were accompanied by male relatives. But contract workers had, there were more women among the contract workers. 
And so there are some folks also who joked about, about that in the course of my research, and they were like, this is solving the gender imbalance for heterosexual couples, right? Where like, we don't have that many women, you have more women. But I, I didn't talk to too many of those folks because there just weren't so many hanging around. But yeah, that's a gist of the contract work as well. So thank you so much for this really like, really enjoyable lecture. Um, and I have so many different questions, but the one I wanted to ask is the the level of detail in your presentation speaks volumes to the incredible amount of ethnographic research you did and the trust that you've developed with your interlocutors. And um, I think you pointed to several moments in your presentation, some moments of potential kind of um, tension with your own identity in those relationships. And I was wondering if you could speak more to how you navigate your own subjectivity while doing such sensitive ethnographic research and maybe some of the benefits of that and some of the perhaps challenges you face beyond that just one example. Thank you so much for that, Amar. So let me read you back to look. how did I balance my subjectivity and potential points of conflict? So I would say in terms of ethnic nationhood or kind of my ethnic national background, I did that, I would say better than with gender. So, so I'll, I'll give you some examples. Even in spaces where I had yet to open my mouth and folks didn't yet realize that I was from the South or that my family is from the South and I was born in Southern Vietnam, they would say things, the Northerners or folks who were yeah, primarily Northerners would be like, why should we have more Southerners come to our events? How come you don't want to hang with us? And, and there were folks who would say things like, Northerners who would say things like, you know, I don't really like to spend time with a lot of other Vietnamese people because they just gossip and blah, blah, blah. But you're different because you're from the South. And so they're like Germans, you're frank and honest. And so you see, you see this mapping, right, of, of the ethnic nation, this ranking of the ethnic nation that puts people from the South who are assumed to be more like Germans at the top and then associates all of these vices with people from the North and Central regions. And it's Northerners who are saying this as well as Southerners, right? So that would be for some really interesting conversations. And then the contrast with Hatton, I think shows me what my reception would have been had I not been born in Southern Vietnam to a South Vietnamese family and spoken with a South Vietnamese accent. The part about gender that I'm only really starting to think a lot more about now is that first summer in 2013, I actually went to Berlin with my sister. We had never been to Berlin before. My German was pretty bad by this point. I hadn't studied it in a couple of years. And we were staying in the eastern part of the city, and we were stalked in broad daylight by a couple of folks who were following us and jeering. And it was a really terrible experience. I almost abandoned my research project after this and talked to my advisors and I said, I don't know if I can do this anymore. So when I did decide to come back, I was like, I'm not going to do anything about gender. I don't want to teach her. I want to stay as far away from that as possible. And I will take measures so that this sexual harassment doesn't happen again. And so what that meant was that I missed, not only missed, but actively avoided all of the ways that my interactions were gendered, right? The first time that I go to RFG and they're like, come into this room, hang out with the aunties. Right, or the ways that they would police women's bodies and say, You're going, we're going to this celebration for the Lunar New Year. You all have to wear out yai. And I'm like, that's not super comfortable. It's really tight and it's not really my jam. But but all of the uncles could just wear whatever they wanted. Right. So I, I missed so much of that. And I missed in large part how these ideas of the ethnic nation were propagated through women's bodies. And so those tensions would come up very infrequently kind of in, in, in my face sort of way, but it was more so in the ways that they rarely gave me a hard time for being childless. At this point, I was in my late 20s. But then people from Central Vietnam, Northern Vietnam who were coming to Germany would be like, you need to get on that because that's the only way you're gonna stay, right? So while I had the privilege of going on to get an education, they assumed of these folks who are associated fully with the state of Vietnam, who are purely a, a vessel for mobility. Thanks for that. 
this presentation is like seven with all my all everything like just mixed up together. Thing. So I'm intrinsically motivated to learn all about this. But one of my interests is like the, the fact that like a lot of these binary distinctions uh, have multiple layers of meaning and they signify multiple different things. So North versus South isn't just communist versus not or uh, uh, Farben versus L. Uh, you know. So I'm I was struck by the comment of the Southern woman in the temple who said that something along the lines of they don't know how to behave properly here. And I'm wondering if that's if the if you interpret that as being like these communists don't know how to be spiritual or these northerners don't understand the way to be human here. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. I especially love that you use the word delicious and think about food very often. And whether the answer is going to involve food. So for folks on Zoom, the question was these binaries, these false binaries, North, South, migrant, refugee, communist, anti communist, actually hide a lot of nuance. So, in the quote from Colm at the Pagoda, where she says all the songs are from the South, and then talks about how people don't know how to behave themselves. Is this about Northernness? Is this about communism? What is this about? So, I'll tell you more about that story. I really jumped into the middle of it, but I spent a lot of time with home. And the first time I met her was at this pagoda. We were on the ground floor and I was talking to a student I call Sun, who had just arrived from Vietnam, also from Haiphong, so from the northern region. And Hom was with an international student in the book I call her him. And she's living with home at this point. And Sun and I are talking and because I'm speaking Vietnamese, she assumes that I'm from Vietnam, but from the South. But then she hears someone mention I'm from the US and she's like, oh, I want to talk to you. Come over here and talk to me. And so she's sitting with me, a student from Northern Vietnam and a student from Central Southern Vietnam, right? Kind of a, a, a mix of, of different kind of belongings. And she's like, why don't you come back to my house and we'll just have tea and we'll hang out. And it's this is the first of many points when she's like, I don't discriminate against our northern brothers and sisters. I try to make friends with everyone and invite them all with you who are from different regions and migratory backgrounds to my house. We're sitting in her living room in kind of central West Berlin, and we're just talking. And she's like, Yeah, when I first started coming to the pagoda, people really hated the language of the northerners. And she means accents here, right? Because I can understand why another human being have different regional accents. But she's like, people really hated the language of the Northerners, and we try to get over that. And we also understood that what she's going to imply is that they're barbarians. She's like, they don't really know how to handle themselves in a Buddhist pagoda. So, you know, in the South, you go to pagoda and you just calmly make an offering or you light some incense and then you work on yourself. But here in the North, but in the North, she gets down on her knees. In her living room, she starts, she starts, can I do this with this here? Kind of waving her hands wildly to be like, it's like they're praying to spirits or something. They just don't know how to behave. But her explanation was, I used to hate that, but my husband explained to me, oh, you know, it's because of communism and the ways that communists didn't allow them to practice anymore. So it's not their fault. But she also connected it to food and was like, you know, the food is not that good, but it's because they experienced famine. <laughs> I mean, they some things that it's about North Koreans too, right? But their food's not that good because they were so poor and the implication is so backward that they couldn't, they just couldn't develop good food. So on some level, it's about this terrible environmental political thing happened to them because famine is not just environmental and natural, right? It's overlaid by, and then the communists wouldn't let them practice their religion, but now they just have bad taste in food and practice of religion and music, and they just don't know how to conduct themselves in a respectful manner. There's a whole politics of respectability bound up with that that manifests in so many different arenas. Thanks for that. I was thinking a lot about like what's the economic 
I want to make sure I heard you correctly. So, what is the role of socioeconomic distinctions potentially across the? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. So, SES and generation. The SES answer question is a little harder to answer because. With former contract workers, there's just a bigger range. So there were some folks who came in the early 1980s, some folks who had come actually before that as students, came back in the early 80s as group leaders for these labor contingents who were fluent in German, had had study training in German. And after the fall of the Berlin Wall, some of them leveraged these resources, got into business, and became very wealthy. So the wealthiest Vietnamese folks I met were formerly contract workers, but there's much more of a range. So there were folks I met who came in 1989, managed to stay. A lot of folks were quote unquote voluntarily repatriated. They were incentivized with something like 3,000 German marks. Many folks were slated for deportation, went back to Vietnam. Some of them found they had changed since I spent time abroad. So let me try to make my way back illicitly. And so there were folks who had been contract workers who 25, 30 years later don't really speak German, are doing these job these jobs at the day job center. That's like a euro a day just to kind of make sure that you're not cheating welfare or something like that. There was a range. The refugees that I met, originally there was a group of Germany, West Germany allowed for 10,000 contingent refugees and their family members. But then that group grew to about 38,000. So a lot of folks I'm sure know that Germany for a long time didn't see itself as a country of migration. And so it was very difficult to get citizenship, but they carved out a path for citizenship and, and access to the welfare state for Vietnamese. So their socioeconomic outcomes, at least among the folks I spent time with, was much, a much shorter range. So folks tended to work for German companies, tended to yeah, spend a lot of time in the western part of the city. So that's the SES question. The generational question, I was interested in, at first, the capacity for folks to carry and or change political attitudes across the life course of the move. So I was really focusing on first generation folks. Now, those first generation folks in a migration sense spanned cohorts. Right? So there were folks who were first generation who came in the 80s, and then there were folks like the international students, Hanny and what did I call her in here, Hatton, who, who had just come in the last couple of years. I did spend time with second generation folks as well, and there were folks who would say, yeah, when we got to university and we would start meeting Vietnamese from different migration streams, that was really weird. The one child refugees was like, I was told, I truly believed that if I ever met a northerner, they would try to kill me. <laughs> That's what my parents taught me. That's what I thought the whole time I was growing up. And so it was strange for him to then go to university and meet other folks. And he's like, oh, you're not going to try to kill me. So they would talk, they would talk about bridging events and get togethers, but then it would hinge on these things like the the words that you're using to say friend or the songs that you're using to celebrate festivities or calling it Ho Chi Minh City instead of Saigon. And it also was refracted through belonging to Germany. So people would say things like they would be speaking in German and when they would switch to Vietnamese, folks with a Southern background would be like, oh, you're from, you have a Northern background. And so they're doing these kind of beliefs, Northern background, East Germany, and they're like, I didn't realize you could speak such good German over there. <laughs> right, which is also thinking about how Aussies are treated in, in Germany today. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm so glad you addressed gender because that was one of my questions, especially when I was looking at the picture of uh, everybody worshiping in this temple. So I hope your field notes are rich enough that you can actually return to that and maybe pull some of those threads out more. Um, so I'm going to ask something different. Um, and I, I guess it has to do with history. 
and how far back the division between north and south goes and you know kind of projecting into the future the ways in which certain moments of, of political division and migration will get mobilized according to whatever is going on politically in the moment. So I, I, I was thinking of it um, when you kept talking about the flag and for some reason the Confederate flag just kept popping into my head and you know these sort of stories that we pass on to kids and you know sort of planting fears in them the ways in which uh accents and you know regions work in the u.s was just a lot on my mind as i was listening to you and so i kind of feel like minus the berlin setting you know like i don't i don't know that reunification is ever completed right and so if you know it's taken so long for the u.s and in fact you know with each generation there's like a new version of the division right um how do you see that playing out I mean, you've got this kind of lovely outside of the u.s context where there are both and a previous divide but i guess i feel like there's a there's a longer time frame to all of these uh, attitudes and assumptions, and you kind of hinted at that a little bit, but I'm wondering uh, if there's anywhere in the book or at least about the, that, that longer durée. Yeah, thank you for the question about a longer view of history and whether some of these tensions, conflicts, to what extent it can take them back to Vietnam, right, or to other places where Vietnamese folks were perhaps. And are mobilized in political yeah. friction in the moment. Yeah. Right? And, and then mobilized the beginning for this in, yeah. in political moments. So I love that you brought up the example of the Confederacy because as I was, I'm trying to think of the timeline, 2021, when I was wrapping up the final version of this book, January 6th happened, right? And then Viet Thanh Nguyen wrote on the front page of the New York Times about people who were there with the South Vietnamese flag alongside the confederate flag right and she's never heard of i'm like no no but also so rich so, <laughs> so it's a great question i'm i don't think i'm going to answer this adequately because i didn't do archival research but what i can tell you is how people constructed that narrative going back to vietnam and so folks would say things in older drawers work has shown this right that both North and South Vietnam were really trying to push this rhetoric of we are one nation, we belong together, and we need to liberate the other side. Now, the North took more steps towards that direction than did the South, but that rhetoric was true on the, for both sides for a long time. And I think people often repeated that rhetoric. So they would be like, growing up, the Northerners would be like, I heard that these were our Vietnamese brothers and sisters across the divide, and we needed to free them. And there's actually someone, I heard this secondhand from his son, a child of former contract workers, who was like, yeah, I heard from my dad growing up that that day, April 30th, 1975, completely changed his life because he was part of the troops that conquered Saigon that day. And he had been told all these stories, like they're starving over there, and then there are these American puppets. And I get to Saigon and I'm like, holy crap, it's so splendid. And I totally screwed up. But then he was part of the machinery that erased South Vietnam that day. And so I think I call him book in the book. The son was like, this is the moment my dad stopped believing in a revolution and in his God. But the idea was not, the idea that was expressed to me was not there was antagonism. It was, we need to save them and we need to be one again. And I think there are folks who write about Germany who say that solidarity is kind of highest at this moment when they're separated, right? And then upon reunification, you realize, hey, maybe after 30 or 40 years in Germany, in Vietnam, in Korea, <laughs> I was going to say the US, but I'll come back to that in a little bit. That people change and they really diverge in their understandings of governance, language, culture, et cetera. And I'm going to come back to the Confederacy example, which I think is just so apt because as I understand it today, 
a lot of these Confederacy insignia have cropped up in, in the last 50, 60 years, right? So it's not this continuous story of we have all been paying tribute. It's mobilized after the fact. And I think that really is really is at work here too, to think about we were one nation as a rhetoric told in the moment of division. And now why can't we get back to that whole? So in the sociologist, I don't assume that there is some unbroken whole that needs to be come back to, but I was just really interested in what they meant when they say that. And I interpret that as saying, we are one ethnic nation, and yet na ethnic nationalism is just not a thing we believe in anymore. Um, since she was talking about separation, it made me think of something, and I don't know the answer to it. And that was, was there always a divide between the North and the South, even before France took over and created Indochina, were there always different attitudes even then? Yeah, I'm gonna rely on what I've read. <laughs> because I'm not a historian, but lots of respect for and use of historical writing. And so what I believe today, based on what I've read from other folks, is that what we consider different regions of Vietnam today kind of interregional antagonism <laughs> is something that goes way back, right? And so I think I would think that that predates France, actually, and you can see that in kind of regionalisms everywhere, but it's the moment that it gets formalized in a nation state apparatus and in international borders that it carries all of this political weight that then gets mapped back onto cultural, religious, gastronomical, okay. and other things. Is there a question? Yeah. I think that um, I think it's lovely to have the you know, personal uh, situation from North and South to East and West Berlin. And I always can talk on about that. But here in the United States, and I'm only out of the I'm not the same as East America. Yeah. And you know, I'm also from California and some of my little friends are actually it's not relatively surprised we have any reunions, but we're together we part of the same time. However, there is a Vietnamese, a Vietnam, Vietnam, uh, Vietnam Maga, people, people, yeah, and um, so, but it is, it is, and I always thought about it for me is when I travel to Vietnam a lot, you know, and I think that in Vietnam the division was inherently there in all of them uh, throughout the country, but it seems it's not as overt as it is in the community, so it would be very interesting to see it in Australia. In a, in a place that you know there's a lot of concentration, but I think that you constantly want to listen to you. Some people have had, uh, I don't know, say or advice that's sort of a, a, a prejudiced vision of one culture to another. Uh, can you, when I'm thinking of it, I agree with you that there needs to be a confront to Vietnam and keep it for a lot in place because I think that Vietnam in these days is not just an upcoming second or third generation. Uh, we can really help to erase, not, not to erase, but to move on, you know, as a nation, rather than rather than having segregation. But it's interesting to see that, uh, and I know we could get these people to have this over, and it's kind of this way as well. I, I'm not sure if I have a question yet, but it's just a challenge to see because mm -hmm. um, when you know quite a bit, you just can't be difficult to ask questions because you know there's so many mm -hmm. factors. Thank you so much for that. Let me just try to capture some of that comment. I'd also be curious to hear where from California. No, sorry, no. Where in Southern California? Oh, oh, where from California? Uh, um, well, one day. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> Very cool. You've got really good food between where you're from and where I'm from. <laughs> so, Also, they use the people who knew the other market. You feel like people are not, they're very private and want to be able to say it. 
And then uh and so now there's the CDA that has gone, the one thing they did not repeat. I wanna see that they're going to I wanna see that they start to be able to to go along where they're going without knowing. So sometimes it's gonna be good, it's gonna bother me, but you know, and then you think, well let me move on to another thing or we're gonna see how that one. <laughs> but it's it's not like it's that that generation, our generation or my generation yeah thanks for that oh gosh so that touched on so many good things that i wish i could say more about vietnam maga or ultra conservative vietnamese in a I don't want to say a previous life, it's the same life. <laughs> but I, I used to also collaborate and do quantitative work on political partisanship with, with the co author Juan Wright. And we were really interested in this disaggregating this politics in the US context. And just in very brief, there are definitely conservative folks, but I think they're more cross migration cohort, at least at the time that. We were looking at the 2000 National Indian American Survey. You also brought up that there are Vietnamese communities in a bunch of other places, right? France, Canada, Australia. Would love to come up with a research excuse to spend a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that I, I wanted to go back to Germany, right? Which is part of this. I don't know, Sebastian Schubert, thank you for the ticket and the reason. But to me, it was also, it was a special case because in all of these other places that we're mentioning primarily in the West, you get Vietnamese who are coming largely after 1975. Of course, there are elites going to study abroad beforehand. You get them largely coming after 1975, though. And then they're coming in waves afterwards of different motivations, right, that, that show that the migrant refugee binary is this false and unhelpful dichotomy. But the narrative overarching is still that of we are all refugees. And Germany is the one place I could think of at the time that had a contrasting narrative as opposed to the other side of that would be these other socialist migrations, right? Where you see largely former contract workers who then erect these pagodas with the bust of Ho Chi Minh, for example, who to many of them signify peace, not communism. So much uh, me and everyone who's coming. I think this is this is this is probably time and we're running a little bit later, but um yeah, thank you again and um yeah. Thank you so much for us and thanks for the training.